Good evening and welcome to Museum After Hours. I'm your host, Trey Johnson, and tonight we are joined by Dr. John Curatola, a Museum After Hours veteran who, I believe, has presented with us more than any other speaker. Dr. Curatola is a retired Marine Corps officer of 22 years and a history professor at the Army School of Advanced Military Studies at Fort Leavenworth. He received his doctorate from the University of Kansas in 2009 and is focused on World War II, air power, and the early Cold War. Dr. Curatola has published two books and is currently working on his third and fourth titles. Tonight's presentation will relate to his upcoming book, Autumn of Our Discontent, Fall 1949 and the Crises in American National Security. The events of a single calendar season, the fall of 1949, led to a change in the American military tradition. The notion that the United States would return to a small peacetime military posture following World War II was shattered with the Soviets' first successful atomic weapon test in August and the establishment of the Communist People's Republic of China on October 1st. These two events ended the illusion that American hegemony would remain unchallenged. These, when combined with the U.S.'s decision to increase the size of its atomic stockpile, the debate regarding the revolt of the admirals, and the secret discussions about thermonuclear weapons, found the United States facing a new round of crises that would become the Cold War. Throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to pose questions as they come to you, and we'll get to as many as we can afterwards. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Curatola. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, if I may see, yeah. is the technology work? Do you have the slides up? <laughs> yeah, if you would uh, start your video for oh, okay. us. And do you Perfect. have them? <laughs> We're good? Yep, we, we are Okay, good. great. Hey, thank you for that introduction. Uh, and I appreciate people uh, signing in on a Friday evening. Uh, I'm surprised you don't have anything better to do than, than listen to my uh, theory on uh, the start of NSC 68, but I appreciate your attendance today. Um, and the, uh, in that introduction, um, yes, I'm a Marine officer who works for the Army who studies the Air Force. So I kind of cover the whole uh, gamut of uh, the American military. Uh, and its history. Um, what I uh, want to talk about here today is how you come about building a large peacetime military that comes under the program of National Security uh, Council Policy 68, or NSC 68 as we refer to it. How did this policy come about at a time when Harry Truman is trying to keep defense spending down to a minimum? And in the course of one fiscal year, the American military's budget will go from a paltry $13 billion to almost $50 billion in one fiscal year. And it will remain at those levels uh, for the rest of, of American contemporaries contemporary era. Uh, so I'm gonna try to explain how this occurs. Uh, and at the end, uh, I'll show you some of the lasting legacies of, of this particular season, okay? Um, as I said, the in September sorry, 1950, uh, the NSC 68. You're going to need to screen share real quick. I'm I sorry. You, you're going to need to screen share the uh, presentation. Okay, hold on. Let me. I uh, think it, it's probably up for you, but it's not. Uh, it's not showing. Okay, hold on. All right, screen share. Here we go. Screen share and. Then How's that? Uh, it's still not showing up. Oh, oh, it's just taking a second. That's perfect. Awesome. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you so <laughs> much. Right. For, thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have to go back. Sorry about that. Okay, um, what I'm going to be getting at here is how the current narrative of the Soviet atomic bomb and uh, the People's Republic of China uh, are, are looked upon as how we got into uh, 
establishing a large military. But my thesis here is that there is much more going on in the fall of 1949 than meets the eye. And as you can see here, the way I'm gonna address this is, is basically by season, uh, because what you see in the autumn of 1949 is a convergence of and simultaneity of a number of issues of which the Soviet bomb and the Chinese are only two of a number of issues that are coming together uh, that forced Truman to make a decision. And that's what we're gonna be talking about here today. Um, what you see in this agenda slide kind of lays that out. But if you look at the article or the uh, cartoon there, uh, you got the little boys there on uh, Halloween, October 31st, 1949 saying, shucks, we can't scare anybody with this stuff. Because if you look at the newspapers behind them, you see Navy purge, Russian bomb explosion, British uh, crisis and fighting communists. These things are all going on at the same time in 1949. And so this is quite a fraught period with regards to national security. So again, I'm gonna be addressing this you know, in a, a uh, seasonable fashion, but in the autumn of 1949, all these things are coming together uh, to cause uh, what I would uh, call it a uh, catalyst uh, regarding American national security. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and start. Okay, uh, as we come out of the Second World War, the United States Air Force sees itself as the predominant military uh, service uh, in the next war. Uh, the use of the atomic bomb over Japan and Hiroshima and Nagasaki see, is looked upon as ushering in a new way of warfare, an air-centric way of warfare. And for the Air Force, they truly believe that they are now the predominant force. However, the Navy has a different view. The Navy also has a uh, a, a fairly large air fleet based off of its aircraft carriers. And ever since the interwar years between the First and Second World War, the U.S. Army Air Corps at the time and the U.S. Navy kind of got into some internal food fights over the use of air power. Who should be in control of it? Where should the money be going? What kind of airframe should we be making? And who is responsible for national defense? Up until that time, the Navy was responsible for coastal defense. Well, now with the advent of air power, the Air Force says it can do it. And most of you are probably familiar with uh, Billy Mitchell and bombing the Osfriesland in 1923. Um, this is an extension of that. So now in the post-war world, what you're seeing is the two services added again. Where do you want to put your eggs in the air power basket? And the slide you see in front of you uh, I got this out of the Navy archive, but what you're looking at is how the Air Force sees it on the left, where they're going to have bombers fly over the polar ice caps and attack the Soviet Union. Or if you look on the right, you can see the Navy is advocating flying off of aircraft carriers for multiple locations to attack the Soviet Union, which is, of course, our main threat at this time. And their vision for this basically comes in terms of their airframes. To the left, you see the Air Force with their strategic bombers. This particular picture, what you see is a KB-50, which is an early area refueling aircraft, refueling a B-50. This is, B-50 is actually called the Lucky Lady 2, and it's the first bomber to circumnavigate the globe uh, via air-to-air -air refueling. And that's what this picture is. It's, the, it's an, an original uh, loops, uh, hose and loop system is what they called it. Um, and so the Air Force sees strategic bombers going deep into the Soviet Union and hitting areas uh, of industry and military targets. The Navy, as you look on the right, sees themselves launching platforms off of aircraft carriers with atomic weapons and then attacking targets on the Soviet uh, coastline. The difference that you see here is that the Air Force will say, we can go deep into Soviet territory while your naval airframes are a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter. They can't go as deep as the Air Force can. And this really begins kind of this argument as to where do you want to put your defensive dollars regarding this new air-centric atomic-based offensive? Uh, actions. And so the 
a fight between the two services kind of be, begins anew. Okay, uh, when we start the secret the, the U.S. Department of Defense with the 1947 National Security Act, James Forrestal is the Secretary of Defense, and and he's a, a workaholic, and he basically works himself to death. And he he uh, has a nervous breakdown, and he is removed from office on March 28, 1949. Um, he's put into a hospital, and then he jumps out of uh, the 13th store of Bethesda Naval Hospital on May 22nd. He's replaced by a guy by the name of Lewis Johnson. Now, Lewis Johnson is a fiscal conservative. He's a Democrat. He wants to support Harry Truman in his uh, fiscal limitations of the U.S. military. Um, he has presidential aspirations, and he also has a pretty big ego. Okay. And what uh, Lewis Johnson does in one of his very, very first steps is look at the new Navy aircraft carrier that they are building coming up here in 1949. Now, regarding the Air Force's view of the Navy, here's how they see them. And I'll, I'll read it for you. It says, you gentlemen better understand the Air Force is no longer going to be a subordinate outfit. It was the predominant force during the war and it's going to be the predominant force, whether you like it or not. And we don't care if you like it or not. The Air Force is gonna run the show. You Navy types are not going to have anything but a bunch of cares, which are ineffective anyway, and they will probably be sunk in the first battle. Now, what's great about this quote is he says it at, at NAS uh, Oceana to a bunch of Navy officers uh, in 1947. So again, this gives you an idea of some of the, the inter-service food fights between the Air Force and the Navy at this time. Uh, in 1948, you will also see the Air Force and the Navy putting a lot of articles and uh, in uh, periodicals to advocate their versions of air power, whether it be sea or strategic uh, air power. Now, for the Navy, I see we got a. Excuse me, let me. <sighs> See me having some web difficulty here, I apologize. Can I help in any way? <laughs> yeah, I've seemed to have lost. There we go. I don't know why I've got a oh, calculator okay. up there now. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> well, we have to keep things interesting. Yeah, but... I apologize for this. I <laughs> we're just I got the wheel of death. Paying attention. Yeah, I'm. Could you, are you able to click outside of that at all? Yeah, I'm trying to. All I'm getting is the wheel of death right now. Okay. 
I'm going to continue to march. Um, and if it's wheel stops, I'll, I'll pick it up from there on the slides. So um, at any rate, in uh, April of 1949, after Lewis Johnson uh, takes over, he's going to review the, the Navy's new aircraft carrier that they put out or that they're planning on building in the USS United States or CBA 58. Uh, it's a bigger, uh, more robust aircraft carrier capable of handling bigger aircraft uh, and launching nuclear armed aircraft uh, to enemy shores. Um, so the Navy has this idea of a mobile landing strip. However, the Air Force has this new bomber called the B-36 Peacemaker. Now the B-36 is a legacy World War II requirement. Uh, it's got six engines that face backwards, four jet engines on the wing tip. So you have six turning and four burning is the word they used to say at the time. And it is the symbol of American nuclear air power. Um, not only can it fly from bases in Alaska over the polar ice cap into uh, central uh, Soviet Union, but it can uh, continue on land in uh, Egypt refuel and then fly back again. At least that's the plan for it. Okay. Well, the USS United States is a big uh, cost and in trying to keep costs down, Lewis Johnson cancels the USS United States without telling the Secretary of the Navy, without telling the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral uh, Denfeld. And uh, as a result, the Secretary of the Navy resigns as uh, a form of protest. Truth was he was gonna retire anyway, but he still uh, resigns out of protest. Uh, as a result, they replace the, the Secretary of the Navy with a gentleman named Francis Matthews, who's a Nebraska representative, uh, whose only experience with naval power is the fact that he has a rowboat uh, on his home, his summer home in Minnesota. So his nickname is Rowboat Matthews. He too uh, is very interested in keeping costs down, and he's largely uh, in support of, of Lewis Johnson's uh, cancellation of the USS United States, and he will remain that way. Um, as a result, naval aviators will feel slighted uh, as a result of the cancellation of this new uh, aircraft carrier. And so this is going to start some pretty uh, nasty uh, shenanigans between the Air Force and the Navy. Okay. Uh, while the Air Force and the Navy are still fighting over um, roles and missions, Secretary of Defense James Forrestal in 1948 decided he really needed somebody to do an independent study of what was going on with these new capabilities that we're building. And he starts this thing called the Weapon System Evaluation Group. And what their mission is, is to provide rigorous, unprejudicial, independent anal analysis and evaluation of present and future weapon systems under probable future combat conditions. So what he's looking for is for scientific application to be used to determine which weapon systems are going to be uh, useful and which ones are not. Okay. Now, at this time, there are some questions about the efficacy of nuclear strategic bombardment. And in May 1949, there's a study that's head up by an Air Force general named Hubert Harmon. And it comes out, and what he says is that an atomic blitz of the current war plan that we have will have a 30 to 40 percent reduction in the USSR's industrial capacity, but it won't be permanent. And he says this atomic blitz will not uh, disrupt Soviet grand strategy, nor the disruption of the, the Soviet Union itself. And he says it might even strengthen Soviet resolve. And we know what Soviet resolve is like given they're fighting against the uh, Germans in the Second World War. Harmon is looked upon as a turncoat by uh, his Air Force brethren because of his report. Uh, and so they really feel betrayed by him. However, uh, he's asked to bury their report and he doesn't, but the report never makes it to Truman. However, with the establishment of the Weapon System Evaluation Group, you are now going to have an outside entity start to look at the Air Force plan with regards to strategic bombardment. And this is going to uh, happen over the course of 1949 and be published in January of 1950. So this is going to occur while these other events are going on. Okay. 
Now, with the uh, gentlemen that are upset given the problems uh, with the cancellation of the USS United States, there are a couple of naval aviators who take matters into their own hands. Uh, one of these gentlemen is a guy by the name of Cedric Worth. Cedric Worth is a reservist who uh, is a Hollywood script writer who also works uh, in the Department of Defense. He's kind of all over the place. Uh, and he feels that naval aviation has been, been slighted uh, because of the cancellation. And he plays, pays a visit up to Glenn Martin, who owns Martin Aircraft Corporation up in Baltimore. And Glenn Martin is kind of an irascible character, and he feels like he's been slighted by the Air Force for post-war aircraft contracts. And the two men start talking, and they come up with basically uh, a laundry list of innuendos, uh, rumors uh, regarding Air Force procurement practices. And so uh, what happens is Cedric Worth starts to create what's called the anonymous document. And what it is, it's a listing of 55 charges directed at the Secretary of the Air Force, Stuart Symington, Convair Corporation head Floyd Odlum, and Air Force procurement practices. None of the charges that are written in the anonymous document are true. All of them are innuendo, all of them are based upon rumor, and none of them can be substantiated. Doesn't matter. Uh, Worth cr creates this document and he publishes it and he sends it to Capitol Hill. And he also sends it to anybody in the press who's willing to read it. As a result of this document, uh, the House Armed Services Committee decides to investigate. Uh, Congressman James Van Sant, who's uh, from Pennsylvania, He's also a Naval Reservist, and he pushes the House Armed Services Committee to pass Congressional Resolution 234, which is going to investigate the B-36. So as a result, they start with a, uh, an investigation, and they're going to have open hearings within the uh, House Armed Services Committee in Congress in August of 1949. The Air Force will come well prepared for these uh, proceedings. They will put together a long documented, well-documented treatise called the History of B-36 Procurement, and it will refute each and every allegation that is put in the anonymous document. When Stuart Symington testifies before the, the Services Committee, he will reply with each charge against him as it is not true to every individual charge that is pointed at him. The Navy's response to these hearings is pretty tepid. It's all over the place. And because the charges aren't true, there isn't much of them to back, back the charges with. And so as a result, the whole case falls apart. While this is going on, the Air Force does its own investigation and finds out who wrote or who they think wrote the anonymous document. And Cedric Worth's names comes up. At the end of the month, as the August proceedings are coming to a close, Congressman Carl Vinson, who's the chairman of the committee, asks if there is a Mr. Cedric Worth in the room. Cedric Worth stands up and he says, I am he, and he's asked to come give a deposition. Vinson asks him, where did you get, or where did you get this anonymous document from? And Cedric Worth's response is, I wrote it. And from there, he recants everything that he wrote. He admits that he uh, made a lot of it up. And the investigation finds, and I quote, not one iota or scintilla of evidence to support these charges. Now, while the anonymous document has now been uh, refuted, it still does not answer the question regarding the B-36. The the Capabilities of the B-36 are still an issue and they still need to be looked at under the uh, resolution that was passed by the Armed Services Committee. That is scheduled to take place in October of 1949. As we move into uh, September of 1949, a WB-29 flying over the North Pacific uh, sniffs out atomic particles that have uh, drifted over from an atomic explosion that occurred in, uh, within the Soviet Union. And so what happens is 
the, we find out the Soviets have indeed uh, exploded a nuclear device. Uh, the fact of the matter is the Americans knew that the Soviet device uh, or the American monopoly would be limited. We fully expected the Soviets to have the bomb, but we thought it wouldn't take place until like 1951 or 1952. This is three years ahead of time. And so as a result, we're a little bit uh, excited that the Soviets have done it this quickly. Uh, one of the reasons why we're so surprised is, of course, the Soviets are a closed society and they're not open to uh, discourse of their scientific achievements. And even within the Soviet Union, the atomic bomb effort is a secret effort already within a secret society. And of course, many of these people who are working on the atomic bomb don't even know they're working on it. Uh, the head of the project is a guy by the name of I Igor Kurchatov. Uh, he's a brilliant scientist. Uh, he's also referred to as the beard because he grows this long beard uh, and it's kind of his uh, signature. And he's working for the guys in charge of the KGB or the secret police at this time, Latvia Beria, who gives him anything he wants uh, in terms of uh, manpower, money, facilities, uh, and, and all matter. Matter of fact, the Soviet Union will press getting a lot of people into looking for uranium in, in uh, Czechoslovakia, and they'll uh, put people to work mining uranium uh, without protective gear, and many of these people die in the process of mining uranium for the Soviet project. Okay. Uh, so as a result, the Soviets now have uh, exploded an atomic bomb years ahead of schedule. Uh, and so the question now is, might they be working on improving it? Because the, what they did use, they copied the American fat man bomb, the implosion bomb that we developed uh, at Los Alamos scientific laboratories and uh, exploded at the Trinity site. And that's what's used over Nagasaki. It's the second bomb that, that goes off. And so this starts the American uh, concern over uh, could the Soviets possibly be ahead with regard to nuclear technology? Okay. On the 1st of October, we're fast forwarding a little bit, is when Mao, of course, establishes the People's Republic of China. This is the formal declaration of it. And it's kind of a one-two punch diplomatically. You had the Soviet atomic bomb, and now we lost China. OK, the truth of the matter is, folks, China was lost years before this. OK, the Chinese Civil War began as early as 1926, uh, and they took a break during the Second World War when the Japanese occupied parts of mainland China. Uh, and the two sides agreed to stop fighting. They really didn't. But at least they come to some kind of a truce during this time. Uh, so what happens is during the Second World War, they stopped fighting each other um, and they put their uh, efforts towards fighting the Japanese. Although the Kuomintang does more of the heavy lifting than Mao's Red Army. The thing is the Kuomintang, who are the people the Americans are supporting in this fight, problem is uh, Chiang Kai-shek is not really uh, an upstanding individual. He's pretty petty. He doesn't really uh, control the entire Kuomintang army. Uh, and the Kuomintang army, quite frankly, is full of grafters. Uh, they are skimming off the top. And actually, they're, they're pretty harsh with the Chinese peasants. Whereas Mao and company is a little bit different with the Chinese peasants. Uh, he mobilizes them. He teams up with them. And this is the single largest uh, demographic in the world, the Chinese peasant. And so he mobilizes them, uh, cultivates them during the war and then after the war. And what happens is the U.S. State Department, who was there in China, sees what's going on. They see the writing on the wall that Mao is going to win this fight. The problem is the Republicans uh, and the conservatives in the United States at this time are pushing for more support for the Kuomintang. However, even after George Marshall goes to China in 1940 tricks and tries to reason with uh, Chiang Kai-shek and tries to give him counsel, they don't listen. And as a result, Chiang Kai-shek is continuing his offensives against the, the, the Red Army and he's losing. 
because Mao has such good mobilization in the countryside. The Kuomintang controlled the cities, Mao controls the country, and he's controlling more and more of the population. So the American Department of State is seeing the writing on the wall. However, the China lobby and the China bloc in the US, those that want to support the Kuomintang, are pushing for more and more aid. The problem is Harry Truman knows that the Kuomintang are, are grafters, and he even says that they're the world's rottenest grifters and crooks, and pouring any more uh, aid into the Chinese is like pouring sand into a rat hole. So as a result, what happens is the Republican Party will blame uh, Truman for his the loss of China. Again, this is happening way before 1949. But in February 1949, the State Department will try to answer the question as to how the loss occurred and what they're going to put out is what's called the China White Paper. That comes out in August 1949, and it basically says, here's why China went red. There's nothing we can do about it. And as a result, that's what they're stuck with now. It doesn't matter. It's not the White Paper is not well received, and most people still blame uh the Truman administration for the supposed loss of China. So you have the Soviet bomb in China as your background uh, to uh, this beginning of the fall period. Okay. Now, as I said, the end of August, the House Armed Services Committee concludes that there's not one iota, not one scintilla of evidence to support the charges against the, uh, the, the Air Force and the B-36. And they're actually thinking about canceling the October hearings that were supposed to review the B-36 as a uh, application. Well, some Naval officers, again, hear this, and another one takes the matter into his own hands. His name is Captain John Cromwell. John Cromlin's kind of an interesting cat. Um, he's a, a racist anti-Semite, okay? Um, but he's also a rabid fan of naval aviation. And what he does is he takes things into his own hands and he holds his own press conference. Yes, this is a naval officer holding his own press conference, telling the Navy or telling the world that the Navy is being nibbled to death by defense appropriations and by this new joint staff. Okay. As a result of him saying this, um, he's put in hack, uh, put in a house arrest and pending court martials. Uh, but again, it raises the question about the United States Navy and its um, place in the world. During this time, as he's put in hack, uh, the commander of the 1st Pacific Fleet, Admiral Gerald Bogan, will write a letter in support of uh, Cromelin saying that the Navy's uh, morale is at low ebb uh, and that the country's being sold a false bill of goods uh, by the Air Force regarding strategic bombardment. This letter is endorsed by Arthur Radford, who is the commander of the Pacific Fleet, and it's endorsed by Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Denfeld, and it's marked as confidential because uh, we don't want it to getting out uh, to the press. Well, John Cromlin gets a hold of the letter and he takes it down to the Washington press office and he gives it to the newspaper men. And of course, what happens is on the front page of the major newspapers is that the Navy's morale is at low ebb that naval aviation is no longer capable and the Navy has significant problems. As a result, the October hearings are indeed going to occur because of what John Cromlin did. He is again put on hack and told that he will be standing in court martial later, later that month. Okay. So with the beginning of the uh, October hearings, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have subject matter experts come talk to uh, Congress about the B-36, atomic power, uh, national defense, and the roles of the Navy and the Air Force. And the people who come and testify are a who's who of uh, the United States military, Chester Nimitz, Curtis LeMay, uh, Vandenberg, Alexander Vandegrift, William Halsey, Ernest King, all come and make their statements regarding support of 
the Navy or the Air Force. Now, Admiral Denfeld, who's the Chief of Naval Operations, who works for Lewis Johnson and the Secretary of the Navy, Rowboat Matthews, who are fiscal conservatives, they're wondering, what is Denfeld going to say? Is he going to support his bosses and say that the cancellation of the USS United States is what should have been done? Or is he going to uh, stay with his Navy brethren and support naval aviation and the new carrier. Just before uh, Admiral Denfeld does his uh, testimony, one of the reporters asked Secretary of Defense Lewis Johnson about uh, Denfeld's uh, possible response. And Johnson responds, well, Denfeld hasn't been disloyal yet. Um, on the morning of the 13th of October, nobody knows what Denfeld's going to say. He has kept his remarks that close hold. Even his wife didn't know. Okay? He takes his seat and he starts out by saying, and I quote, I want to state forthwith that I fully support the conclusions of the Navy and Marine officers who have preceded me. And from that, he goes on with a long list of suggestions regarding national defense saying that we should wait to make such decisions until the weapon system evaluation group um, has been concluded and that we should be reviewing the joint staff procedures. So he does not break ranks with his naval officer. He breaks ranks with his bosses and he is largely lauded by those wearing gold braid. Okay? Secretary Matthews is so upset that he leaves the, the, the Senate chambers. He gets on an airplane he and he flies up to uh, New York City and he pays a visit to Chester Nimitz and he asks Chester Nimitz, how do I get rid of him? Nimitz replies, you have to go to Truman to get him uh, out of office. So the the writings on the wall regarding Denfeld's uh, future, although he doesn't know it yet. On 19 October, the chief of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Omar Bradley, is going to testify. His testimony will probably be the single most important part uh, of these proceedings. And what he comes out, he comes out swinging, saying the Navy has misrepresented the facts. He defends strategic bombardment. He talks to the fact that. Uh, each service gets its fair share of the budgetary pie. And then he goes after naval officers saying that if they have low morale within their ranks, it reflects the troops' confidence in their own leadership. Then he goes after Admiral Denfeld. Denfeld is kind of unusual in the fact he's the only chair, or he's the only service chief who did not have a combat command in the Second World War. All the other services did. And so what Omar Bradley says is, I am, I am not associated with Admiral Denfeld's combat record during the war. And actually says this as kind of a personal slight. There's stunned silence in the room after um, Bradley, or, uh, Bradley gets it done. And most people concur that the, the Navy's arguments are pretty much blown out of the water, no pun intended, by Bradley's statement. So as a result, the House Armed Services Committee doesn't necessarily make any conclusions. It doesn't reverse the USS United States decision. It doesn't say one services approach is better than any others. And it doesn't provide any real clear path regarding national security focus, okay? But what does happen is that Admiral Denfeld is fired. He's told about it over the radio. Uh, he had, nobody contacts him personally, and a number of, of naval officers are put into exile as a result. Uh, a new chief of naval operations, Admiral Four Sherman, is sworn in in the beginning of November, and when he's asked about the USS United States in the current row, he just replies, I'll have more once I know more about the job. So he doesn't have much to say about it. Now, while that is all going on, folks, we're not done yet. Remember, the Soviet Union now has the atomic bomb. Okay, we got that. Well, in 1946, there's a conference at the Los Alamos Scientific Lab over the idea of fusion, not fission, but fusion. 
And what happens with fusion, and I am not a physicist, nor do I pretend to be one, but instead of breaking apart atoms, you join the uh, hydrogen, uh, two atoms together, and you get a response out of it, an even bigger uh, requirement or even bigger explosion. Fat man and little boy are about 20 kilotons worth of explosive uh, power. A fusion-based weapon will have about one megaton worth of power, 10 times the amount uh, that you have. And the concern here now is the Soviets are so far ahead uh, with uh, fission. Are they ahead with fusion? This is a concern. Okay. Also, at the same time, the American stockpile it's not that big, and the Department of Defense is asking for more weapons, more, more uh, atomic warheads. And so what happens is they ask, Truman asked for a study in, Jan, in July of 1949, and he gets, of course, an answer in October saying we need to increase the stockpile. He doesn't have a problem increasing the stockpile, but the question before him now is, should we start looking at thermonuclear applications? Should we develop a fusion-based bomb because the Soviets might be doing this already. Given this question over the morality of building a fusion-based bomb, they pulled together some of the old uh, brains from the Manhattan Project, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, uh, Enrico Fermi, and Isidore Rabi, and they asked him to review this. And they're part of what's called the General Advisory Committee to the Atomic Energy Commission. And they come to the conclusion that we should not build this thing, that uh, it is a moral imperative not to do this. Okay? However, there are others at the Los Alamos lab and the Military Liaison Committee and within the Atomic Energy Committee who are pushing for the development of hydrogen weapons. One of the most important people about this, uh, pushing this, is the head of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, Senator Brian McMahon, and he is all for it. Also within the Atomic Energy Commission, Louis Strauss is all for it. However, the chair of the Atomic Energy Commission, David Lilienthal, is not. He thinks uh, the discussion over the de development of thermonuclear weapons is pretty discouraging. Okay. So, as a result, you have uh, two sides of the coin here. You have the Joint Command, Atomic Energy, pushing for it, but Atomic Energy Commission members who don't want to have this thing happen. Um, and as a result, Truman's stuck in the middle. And so what happens is Truman wants to get some input from the various entities, the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy and the Atomic Energy Commission. David Lilienthal goes to visit Harry Truman uh, on the 21st of November, and they're talking about his resignation, Ling Falls resigning as the chair. And he wants to get the Atomic Energy Commission's position to uh, the president before uh, the Atomic or the Joint Committee gets their paper in there. And what uh, Lillian Thal tells him is he says to the president, I want you to get you the AEC position before the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy Commission tries to blitz the White House. And Truman's response is, I don't blitz easily. So given this two-sided issue, Harry Truman puts together what's called the Z Committee. And that's what they call it. It's made of the Secretary of Defense, uh, Lewis Johnson, Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, and the Atomic Energy Commission Chairman, David Lilienthal. They only really meet once on the 22nd of December, and they come to no consensus, consensus and Johnson just argues with Lillian Fall for about three hours, and that's what comes of it. However, there's a new head of plans and policy at State Department by the name of Paul Nietzsche. He, of course, replaces uh, his predecessor, uh, uh, Kennan, and is more... Uh, aggressive and more firm in his belief in defending uh, American national sovereignty and an offensive stance. So in December 1949, the Z Committee meets, and as a result of their lack of consensus, Nietzsche puts together uh, a three-element proposal for how to go forward given the thermonuclear question. Now, 
In January 1950, the Weapon System Evaluation Group 1 results come out. And basically what it says is that the off-tackle plan that they study, the U.S. Air Force is going to hit 26 Soviet cities with 220 atomic weapons with 72 planned reattacks on 104 urban centers. And the evaluation says that 80% of the Air Force bombers will indeed hit their targets. Seems pretty good. However, the overall loss rate for the Air Force would be between 41 and 55 percent. You're going to lose half of your air fleet. This is uh, far in excess of what the bomber losses were during the early days of the combined bomber offensive over Europe in the Second World War. Those loss rates were around 10 percent per mission. We're going to lose almost half of them during this. They also see no appreciable gain with the capabilities of the B-36, and they find a number of logistical shortfalls in the Air Force's structure in terms of refueling and runways and maintenance personnel and those kinds of things. Um, and as a result, the WSG report says, uh, doesn't say it won't work. It doesn't say, doesn't get any definitive conclusions. It just points out some shortfalls and some factors to consider with regard to strategic bombardment. Now, when Lewis Johnson and uh, Harry Truman get this briefing from the Weapon System Evaluation Group, Secretary of Defense Lewis Johnson turns to Harry Truman and he says, there, I told you they said the B-36 was a good plane. And Truman responds, no, damn it, they said just the opposite. So again, you have this kind of ambiguity that's going on with regard to national defense and where should we be putting our defense dollars, okay? Now, this argument over the super is classified. However, in January 1950, it starts to leak out that there's an issue going on over what they call the super bomb, is how they refer to it. And what happens is as this leaks out, it's making Harry Truman have to make a decision, okay? And what happens is Dean Atchison, the State Department, begins to see that the value of the super that if we don't have it and the Russians do, we're at a disadvantage. The Department of Defense sees it much the same way. Although the Atomic Energy Commission still is pushing back on the development of the, the super bomb based upon moral grounds. Okay. For the DOD, the way they look at it is it is inconceivable that this country would get itself into a position where the Soviet Union might have it and we would be left without. On January 31st, the Z Committee meets across the street from the White House, and they come to the conclusion that the president should direct the Atomic Energy Commission to proceed with the technical feasibility of thermonuclear weapons, that we should indicate publicly to determine the feasibility of thermonuclear weapons, that we tell people we're doing this, and that the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense should undertake a re-examination of our objectives in war and peace. That, folks, is what gives you NSC 68. That third part of that agenda is what sets forth the movement toward developing this new national outlook. They head to the president's office by noon, and they get in the Oval Office at 1235, and Atchison hands Truman uh, the letter of recommendation. AEC Chair David Lilienthal tries to interject to explain, to provide some further context, and Truman cuts him off. And his res Truman's response set is, can the Russians do it? They all nod in the affirmative, and Truman says, then we have no other choice, we'll go ahead. The meeting lasts seven minutes. As a result of that meeting, you are now gonna start building are looking into the feasibility of thermonuclear weapons, which of course we know is feasible now. And we will start doing a wholesale review of national military strategy. The very next month, Klaus Fuchs's espionage in the Manhattan Project becomes public knowledge. Fuchs was also at the 1946 fusion conference that was at the Los Alamos labs. That adds more fuel to the fire that maybe the Soviets could be possibly ahead of us. And the military liaison committee comes to the conclusion that the Russians' knowledge is equal to ours. They have kept pace with us 
and they may already have super bombs in production. None of that is true. But in February 1950, we can't refute those things. Also in February 1950, some of you might remember a senator by the name of Joe McCarthy is going to say that he has a list of known communists in the federal government. Okay, Of course, we all know Machine Gun Joe doesn't have any <clears throat> list of known communists, but it makes for good press. This is the start of that Red Scare. Now, let's go back just a second to talk about the fall of the Kuomintang. The, uh, that is when the State Department starts to be charged with having Soviet sympathizers in it, and that there are pro-communist elements within the State Department that are siding with Mao. This carries over to Joe McCarthy, and the Red Scare begins in earnest, as we have now heard about. By April of 1950, the first draft of NSC 68 goes to Harry Truman, and it sits on his desk for months because it's going to recommend this huge increase in money. It doesn't give a figure, but we know it's going to cost a lot to stand up a large standing military to deter the Soviet Union. And it sits on, on his desk and a number of desks for months. And then in June in 1950, North Korea invades South Korea. That certainly removes any lasting doubt at the time regarding communist intention. Now, we know now that it was really more of a local fight, but in 1950, the United States doesn't see the war that way. Uh, by August of 1950, Truman will approve NSC 68, and of course, the defense budget will go up exponentially over the next few years. As a lasting legacy, what will happen is the American budget will stay uh, around uh, $400 billion. Uh, that's adjusted for inflation in years uh, for starting then and to the contemporary era. It will fluctuate, of course, as years go by, but it begins here in 1950 as a result of the confluence of all of those actions that came together in one season. So with that, I apologize for the slides. I don't, I can't speak to the electrons, but I will uh, welcome any questions you may have regarding what I've just presented. And again, I apologize for the slides. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Curatola. Uh, if you could just stop the screen share real quick or- I would, I'll be happy to stop the screen share. <laughs> me if I can. He just fixed it. I think. Stop it. All right. There we go. Okay. I apologize profusely for that. Oh no, no problem. It happens frequently, but okay. it's uh something that we have learned uh, learned to live with here. So all right. So let's get to it. So first question from Isaac. Uh, as for the loss of China does anyone think that if Truman had sent troops to China um, on the side of Chiang Kai-shek, yeah. uh, it would have prevented the communist takeover? I'm sure that's what the Republicans Yeah, imply. Yeah, the, a couple of things to answer that question. One, Truman is not, and nobody in the United States is interested in getting a land war in Asia. One of the classic blunders, if you watch Princess Bride, right? We all know that. Of course. <laughs> of course. Um, one, nobody want, yeah. one, nobody wants that. Um, and even sending troops to Korea is problematic for Truman. Um, so nobody wants to get involved in China. Um, we're giving them money. And of course, you got to remember, we're just coming out of the Second World War. Um, peacetime prosperity is the priority for the Truman administration. And had we sent troops there, it wouldn't have mattered. It would have been a waste of time and effort because Mao, as I mentioned, has now mobilized the single biggest demographic in the world, the Chinese peasant. Um, and he has leveraged that power. Um, and you have throngs of Kuomintang soldiers laying down their weapons and joining the communists. Um, because the Kuomintang has basically, uh, they're, they're their own worst enemies. They are the ones who have been siphoning money off, treating the peasants poorly, you know, not really uh, fighting for 
the country, but fighting for themselves. And so that really is not uh, an option. Uh, there are some people who, who will bring it up, but Truman never considers it. And think about uh, during the Korean War, uh, the Chinese thought we were going to go past the Yalu, take a left hook and come down um, into uh, Beijing. Um, that was never a consideration. And of course, uh, there's that whole debate about the Truman MacArthur uh, actions, you know, in 1952. Um, but no, I, I'm of the belief that that would have been more wasted time. And they even have a discussion after uh, the PRC is established uh, the, a week later at the State Department. They ask, well, should we be uh, sending troops to Formosa, you know, to defend as the, the, the PR, as, as the Kuomintang go to Formosa, should we defend that? Should we put a line in the sand and send troops? And they come with the resounding response, no. This is what the Chinese people have chosen. This is the path that they want. Who are we to go in and change it? And that is actually a discussion that occurs in August of 49. Thank you. And thanks for the question, Isaac. Um, uh, Ronald, who's always, uh, always tuning in here. Uh, Dr. Kuratola, I hope this question is not too far off topic tonight. Uh, were the Rosenbergs really guilty of giving nuclear secrets to the Russians? Yeah, they're part of it. Um, and they deserve what they got from what I have seen. Um, Klaus Fuchs, uh, the, what's interesting in, in the research of this book, and I didn't go into it uh, today because uh, there's so much going on. Um, the Soviets know where atomic research is being done within the United States. And they target those labs, Princeton and Los Alamos and uh, a number of uh, Berkeley and these places, they will send people there on purpose to embed themselves. And what's interesting is that when the Soviets collect, when they steal this stuff, it goes to Beria and it goes to Igor Kurchatov and he holds on to it. He doesn't disseminate it. And so what happens is when they come up with certain problems in their own uh, bomb development, he goes into his file and goes, oh, well, try this. Oh, well, why don't you look at this? And they're like, wow, this guy's a genius. It's because he's got this research. And this is why many Soviet scientists believe that this is a Soviet project and this is a Soviet design and that we did it ourselves. And it's not. It is a copycat of Fat Man. And as a matter of fact, there are some Soviet scientists who say we can design this and we can make our own. And they are told by Beria, no, you won't. You will build it the same way the Americans built it because we know it works. And we can't afford not to have it work. The, some of the proposed Soviet design, the one that they put it, is actually smaller and weighs less and it does work. But they were told to build the exact cop a copy of the American bomb, and they do. Well, that's fascinating. <laughs> Excellent answer. Um, let's see. Uh, so here's a question that I think uh, we were all kind of thinking uh, when we heard the, the title of this talk. Can you draw any parallels between the autumn of 1949 and now? Yeah, I figured I was going to get that question today. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And, I, and I, I was on the treadmill today and I was thinking long and hard about, you know, how, what, are, what are these parallels here? Um, what I would argue, and, I, and this is my opinion, it is not the School of Advanced Military Studies, U.S. Army, those kinds of things. Um, I think what we're seeing is, is somewhat of a return to the Cold War. Um, Russian or Soviet, I don't care. I think they're the same mindset. Um, and I'm not defending Russia or the Soviet Union at all. So please don't think that. But the Soviets are uh, very concerned about democracies on their border, uh, Western influence on their border, for good reason. When you consider Napoleon, First World War, Second World War, and what has occurred on those frontiers in relatively recent history. Um, and so they are fearful of the West. Um, and so I, I don't advocate what they're doing, but I see that this is part of their defensive posture 
to, to, to have these buffer states there. Um, and so I think we're seeing a return, what is old is new again kind of thing uh, with regard to what's going on in Ukraine. And I also think, uh, and again, this is an opinion and you can feel free to disagree with me. Um, Putin is an ex-KGB officer who wants to see, wants to make Russia great again, if I can use that term. Um, and uh, he's trying to make the Russian bear resurgent. Um, and so I think those parallels are there as we see the Soviet Union back in the days trying to uh, buffer itself against the West. And I think we're seeing much of the same as you have the, the democracies in the Baltic states and Poland and these other countries that used to be, you know, Eastern Bloc are now Western Bloc, if I can use that term. Does that help provide context? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for answering it. Uh, I know it's, it can be difficult to... Uh, <laughs> yeah. And again, those are my right opinions, now, not any, that's nothing official. Right, of course. Um, uh, we've got a question from Major Drew Horgan here. Um, uh, was Harmon's assessment, nuclear bombardment possibly increasing the resolve of Soviet civilian population, born from an assessment of World War II strategic bombing campaign? Yeah. Was he the only one coming to this conclusion since it would be hearsay to yeah. the Air Force? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and, and I'm glad he asked that. Here's, here's the issue about resolve uh, with regard to strategic bombardment is the combined bomber offensive, the American execution of it, not, not the RAF, is going after, you know, enemy factories and, and infrastructure specifically, even though we miss a lot of it, we kill a lot of people, don't get me wrong. Um, but the idea is undermine enemy morale by destroying their infrastructure and their ability to wage war. That's kind of the, the underpinning idea behind it. And when the bomber survey in 1946 comes out and it looks at the effects of the combined bomber offensive against uh, the Germans, what they find out is it didn't really have that morale effect that we had hoped it would have. And why is because it's a totalitarian society. You got to go to work. You know, that's all there is to it. And uh, if I may, uh, and a personal anecdote on this one, um, I had an office mate whose mother-in-law was a Luftwaffe flak sergeant. Not kidding, making it up. His mother-in-law was a Luftwaffe flak sergeant. And uh, I interviewed her and talked to her a little bit about her experiences shooting an 88 millimeter cannon at B-17s over Berlin in 1944 and 45. And I asked her, I says, well, when, when did you know the war was over? That, you know, you're gonna lose. And she goes after Stalingrad, 1943, we kind of knew, okay, the writing's on the wall. And so I said, well, then why did you keep fighting? And she goes, and her answer was perfect. what do you want me to do? What do you expect me to do? You know, I'm like, of course, and we would, and you'd be no different. We would be no different. We would still fight for our homeland, regardless of the, what's going on. So to, to take this forward, um, there is still that element within the Air Force at this time that morale can be affected. And, and if you're in the Air Force in 1946 and 1947, you won the war. Right when my slides with Kaflui, you had that quote, you know, about the Air Force saying, hey, we're in charge now. And so this idea of morale uh, is still an underpinning theme for Air Force strategic bombardment. Um, but there are others who are saying, didn't you just see the Soviets lose 25 million people and not give up? <laughs> and there are many within the State Department who will say, oh, and this is, I think it's Kennan who says, all you're going to prove to the, to the Soviets is that we are the barbarians they say we are. That's an actual quote. And so there is that debate going on um, about, yeah, we can rubble these cities, but towards what end? There are, these questions are starting to be asked at this time. They're the minority, um, but they are starting to be asked. And, and as time goes on, more and more people are going to ask them. But this idea of the morale factor on the Soviets, at the time, we think, well, they will... Uh, break but there are those saying no they're not you're just going to prove that you're a monster and they're going to get even more upset and get more uh resolved in, in fighting the united states and so again it does come up as a as a matter of discourse between which camp you live in on this 
Oh, great, great, great question and fantastic answer uh, and wonderful personal anecdote. <laughs> uh, so it looks like we got one last question left. Um, wouldn't the lack of a Soviet Navy in 1949 argue more strongly for the Air Force option? Yeah, um, that comes up. As a matter of fact, in the, of course, I didn't have time to, to go through it uh, with you today, but when, you, uh, when I was in the archives um, at the Navy Yard in Washington, I found other briefing slides for the October uh, uh, hearings. And that is a serious point of contention for the Navy saying, we are a naval power. We should use our naval power uh, to the greatest extent possible because the Russians aren't a naval power. And so we can control sea lines of communication. The Air Force can't. And this is part of this argument that goes all the way back to the interwar years. What is the best way to spend your defense dollars? Is it in some bombers or it is some ships? And again, this is a continuation of that same argument. And the Navy will make that uh, in October 1949, saying the Air Force doesn't understand controlling sea lines of communication is important because we're a maritime power. And so the Air Force is missing that whole idea. And their slides have all these little pictures of boats and, you know, airplanes flying over them and you know, the importance of sea lines of communication. So it is part and parcel of those discussions. Again, what camp do you want to sit in in 1949 as to whether or not you think that's a valid argument or not? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Curatola, for, for being with us here tonight and uh, work, working through the uh, ever entertaining aspect of yeah, doing I've, virtually. <laughs> yeah, I've still got the wheel of death going on here, so I, I don't know what. Well, well hey, we, we are very lucky that it didn't interrupt your connection or anything like that. So we, we still got... Uh, to hear your fantastic presentation. I uh, still got to hear you answer some great questions. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much. And I appreciate your time and effort. So you have a good night. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, and I hope all of you join us again next month uh, because we have an enticing presentation on the menu for you all with Richard Foss's Food on the Westward Trails. The diet of trail travelers was monotonous, but with the inclusion of a few luxuries, it brought a hint of home to desolate prairie camps. So I hope you can all join us next month, April 8th at 6.30 for that presentation. Uh, thank you all for working with the technical difficulties that we've had tonight. And from all of us here at Museum After Hours, thank you so much and have a wonderful